anyway. You couldn't go to afford to trip to the Bahamas or to St. Thomas or the Virgin Isles or whatever else, or, uh, or Barstow. And so what she would do, I'm just kidding. So what they would do for a, <laughs> for a month straight, <laughs> they would toast honey wine for a month straight. Imagine that. All right. Then there's some other things associated with the wedding. Now, one of the things that associated with the wedding, like if you were at the wedding yesterday, you saw that they did a covenant of sand. And basically, they would take they they had two different glasses of sand. The, the sand was two different colors. Okay. And in these two different colors of sand, one represented Jessica, and one color of sand represented Stephen. And they poured their sand together in this vial that was shaped like a heart. You know, it's sand, and it's a little bitty opening. And it's always so funny to watch couples do that, because when they go to tip it, they, they collide. They can't both pour their sand at the same time. Kind of like using the bathroom. Can't always, <laughs> the woman needs the mirror. You can't always have that. It's tough to brush your teeth at the same time. Just watching the wife spit that stuff. Mm, not good for later. And so you get all these visuals. And so they kind of learn to take turns. They learn to kind of do that. And so yesterday they went from bumping glasses, bumping glasses. Jessica gave, gave him the look. So he relented. And she poured a little. And then he poured a little. And then she poured a little. And then he poured a little. And it, some of it spilled because marriage is messy. It's not always night, nice and neat, tidy, is it? Sometimes, sometimes it's not so perfect. They finally got it all together. Then we took it and they had bit, bit their hand, placed their hands on it, and we shook it. And the, and the idea being that you take everything that she is, which isn't really everything that he is. They're really different. You pour them into one container. You shake them up, and now they're even though they're different, they're inseparable. You see it. Now, the rice covenant, if you want to look it up sometime, in Numbers chapter 18, verse 18, and also in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 4, there's several references in Scripture to whenever a covenant would be made between one person or another, they would use salt. And, and there's, you won't find salt covenants specifically in the Bible for marriages, but they would use salt covenants as marriages. And here's the idea of a salt covenant, Okay. They would take the salt. He would have his salt. Notice it's a different container because he doesn't look like her. He's really, really different than she is. And hers is different than his. And the idea is you would take this salt and you would pour it in there just like the sand, but you pour it in just like this. Now here's what's different about a salt covenant from a sand covenant, okay? Salt by many people is considered to be the purest of all earthly materials. The purest. Now, in a sand covenant, some of the sand yesterday was red and some of it was brown. And so you pour that in there and technically, technically, you may be able to, if you're CSI or something, separate the pink sand from the brown sand. Just literally. One by one, but you can do that. You understand that? Maybe it take you 10 years, but you can do it. But you pour salt together, and you begin to mix it up, and you begin to shake it up, just like this. Is it ever, ever, ever going to be possible to separate his salt from her salt? Ever. Is it ever? It's not, is it? And that's the idea. You can't separate the one from the other. And if you're going to try to separate, you'll, you'll rip away part of one person and part of the other person. Then, let's see if I can find it here. It, it, it won't light with Visine. A little lighter here somewhere. Did I put it over there? I could just use this big one on the table here, couldn't I? Now, There's another thing. Somebody in here mentioned that they love the unity candle part, right? Here's the idea behind the unity candle. The unity candle, the idea is that you have this light and you have this light. 
and I'm going to let them kind of burn a little brighter. But what you end up doing in a unity candle ceremony is somebody plays a really pretty song. Ron did a fantastic job with his song yesterday. I tell you what, they'd have been proud of Barstow yesterday. And then you take this, and you take these two candles together, and you together, you light the center candle, just like that, okay? Now, technically what's supposed to happen in a unity candle service is it really is supposed to stay like that. I've seen it done both ways in marriages. I've seen some marriages where they blow the outside two out, and some marriages where they leave the outside two lit, with the, the center one being there. And the idea being that, you know what, they've come together and they are one, but they'll always maintain their individuality. They're, they're, they're always gonna be different. I'm never gonna be like you and you're never gonna be like me. But we are united in the center by what unites us, and that's our faith, that's our pledge to be married, that's our oath, that's our love. You understand that? Now, in Scripture, it's the same picture. Here's her, here's him, they come together and they do that. Now, when you come together and you do this, okay, now, let me kind of show you where that goes. You go from being this, this is our honeymoon picture. No, no, this is our um, engagement picture. See that? Who is that guy? It's our engagement. You've seen it. Don't look at me like, look at me like you've ever seen it. Okay? You go from that, okay? It says this, and I've read this to you before. So from now on, we, 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 uh, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ this, so we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. 
The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us himself to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now go to chapter 6, verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony there is there between Christ and Belial, or the devil? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are what? The temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, here's what I want you to see. Go, to, to go a few books over to Galatians. Actually, Galatians, Ephesians. Two books to your right. Galatians chapter 2. Here's what I want you to see. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I'm going to rifle through about four scriptures I want to show you. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says this. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, do you see that? Read verse 20 again. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life in the body... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so here's the picture. In a marriage, this is really pretty much what it's like. It's like I'm always going to be who I am. I, I love football, for example. My wife, she tolerates football. She'll watch football because she loves me. And you know, my kids are very different than me. Some are more like her, some are more like me, but some are like we don't know who they are. <laughs> We don't understand any of that. And you know, God's doing different things in Teresa's life than he's doing in my life. And so we can say those candles don't exist. It's just one candle. That's really not true. I mean, that candle, that's what unites us. But we're really two different people. We will always be two different people. But in Christ, it's supposed to be different. In Christ, the idea is this. And baptism symbolizes it better than anything else. In Christ, when we come to Christ and say, I give my life to you, there is a death. And there's new life. If you heard the phrase born again, the Bible says that unless you've been born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. But in Christ is this idea that I die to self. And when I give my life to Christ, there's just Christ. I, it says I'm a new creation. I'm not even the same person that I was. I'm a different person. On the inside, and in all ways, I'm different. I'm changed forever. I will never, ever be the same. Do you understand that? I can take you through these scriptures. Let me go, go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse 24. It says this, it says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and what? It dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Go to Luke chapter 9, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 9. I mean, uh, Mark chapter 9. Don't listen to what I say, listen to what I mean. 